Amen. Great. If you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to open them up. If you don't and you're here in the service, you can turn in our bulletin. We have the scripture printed out in English, French, and Spanish because we do have folks in our congregation that are also Spanish. And so we have our scripture printed out in those different languages. And it is a very brief passage of scripture today. Uh, it is from Romans chapter 5, and I'll be hitting on verses 6 through 8. And here's what God's word says. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps for the good person someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. We're working through understanding why Jesus went to the cross, why it was so important that Jesus would go and pay that price and die and be raised again to life. And as we're looking to understand what it is that he has done, we realized last week, for those of you that were here or watched online, we realized last week that he did this because it was our problem. It wasn't because of his problem. He did this out of his own desire to draw us into his care because of his love for us. He recognized the, the devastating nature of our condition, and then he came up with a plan, or he designed a plan, probably from the beginning of time, to restore us into uh, his loving care. So uh, this morning what I want to do is continuing on and recognizing what he has done. I want us to look a little bit about um, what exactly God knows about us. Now, many of us today are very um, cautious about first impressions, right? Um, and there's many, many ways now that we make first impressions that are far different than maybe even just 40 years ago. 40 years ago, we had to worry about, you know, like how we dressed, how we conducted ourselves when we talked to people, um, and kind of had our little chit-chat um, thoughts in our minds. Of, okay, well, here's what I do, here's where I live. You know, we had these little introductory phrases to try and put our best foot forward when we talk to folks. Nowadays, with the invent of social media, there is all kinds of information out about you. A lot of it's out there that you don't even put up yourself. Other people put out there. And um, there is a huge market in making sure that your uh, photos are screened properly, how you have just the right pose to make you look about 20 pounds lighter, um, how you're able to um, phrase things. Um, it, it's interesting. My, my daughter is uh, finishing up her degree, and she's going to be looking for uh, work. And there's this whole other area called LinkedIn, which is a whole professional uh, resume type um, social media type thing as well. And, and how you uh, market yourself is something that we're noticing that exists in our world today that didn't before. What I want us to see is as we look to God, we need to realize that we do not need to market ourselves to God. We do not need to sell our image of who we want to be or project to God but that instead that he knows us intimately. If we uh, look throughout the scriptures, we can see the different things that God knows about us. And uh, I think it's important for us to know this because until we understand how well God knows us, we won't understand the love that was demonstrated towards us. Because we may think the love that was demonstrated towards us was demonstrated because maybe we fooled God into something. Maybe we looked good to God. But instead, I want us to see exactly what God knows about us through his omniscience, his, his, um, his ability, his creative nature. He understands us thoroughly. God knows you better than you know you. And I don't know for you, that's a scary thought, to realize that God knows us better than we know ourselves. He, um, well, I'll just follow through. Here's what it says. He knows our beginning. The, t the Psalm 139 tells us that we were knit together in our mother's womb, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Another passage in Scripture says that he knew us from the beginning of time and set us forth with, um, 
with uh, good works to accomplish in his name. God knew us before we even had a form. That's how well God knows us. He knows us on a soul level. He knows our very beginning. Uh, he knows our names. Uh, he knows each one of our, our, our names. Like he knows us that well. He knows us personally. We don't have to go up to God and introduce ourselves. I was one of uh, a number of grandchildren. My dad had 10 brothers and one sister. They all carried on the family tradition of having larger families, except my parents. And so when I would go to see my grandparents, I would have to often remind them what my, my name was. <laughs> I am Perry. I'm Ellery's son. Oh, yeah, yeah, Perry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God doesn't forget our names. God, God doesn't go, oh, that person there, what's his name again? God knows your name intimately, just as he knew Moses' name, uh, as we see through Exodus 32, verses 12 and 17. He knows our names legitimately. And if he knows our names, he knows um, uh, what we have been labeled by our families, but he also knows our very nature. Because as we know God's name, he knows our name. There's something more than just a name that's tied into that. It's our very nature. He knows our heart. Um, in John 1, 3 and 20, uh, God says that uh, he is greater than our heart and he knows all things. As uh, Solomon uh, was dedicating the temple, he, he said forth that God knows the hearts of all the children of men. He knows what's going on in your heart level. Right? Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's what we're told by the prophet Samuel as he was looking to uh, choose the next king of Israel. God knows our hearts. I doubt sometimes we know our hearts. I doubt sometimes that we fully understand the deceitfulness that often is in our hearts and, and, the, and the mixed emotions that exist within our hearts. He knows our thoughts. Um, as, we, as we look through the Psalms, we're told in Psalm 139 that God knows my thoughts so far off and that no thought can be hidden from God. We see that in the, in the book of Job. He knows your heart. He knows even what you're thinking. The scriptures even tell us he knows the words that we're going to say before they're even formed on our lips. He knows our actions. The scriptures tell us that God shall bring every work into judgment and with every secret thing, whether it be good or bad, it will be exposed before God. God knows all of our actions. When we're trying to communicate with God, we don't need to, to sugarcoat situations where we've acted inappropriately. And we don't need to brag up before God those places where we acted properly. He knows every single one of our actions. He has more than a database on us. He has an awareness of us as a parent has their awareness of their children. And when you think, well, how can God keep track of 8 billion people? Think of the universe that God is in control of and how nothing falls outside of his realm uh, and of his care. He knows our actions. He knows our thoughts. He knows our words. There is not a word on my tongue that God does not know. We're, we're told in Matthew 12, verse 36. He knows our words. He knows our thoughts. He knows our actions. He knows our weaknesses. One of the things that gives me comfort is that God knows how frail we are. He knows we are, as the scriptures say, but dust. He knows that we exist uh, in just a moment like a vapor in time. He knows that we are not strong and powerful as he is. He knows we are just his creature, his creation. But in that uh, he offers his care towards us. He knows that when we rest in our weakness before him, that we can find his strength. He knows the number of our days. He knows when we rise and when we lay down. He knows how long we will walk this sod. Uh, he, he knows us intimately and thoroughly. Um, the scriptures even tell us, the psalmist says in Psalm 31, verse 15, that our times are in his hands. So the reason why I took some time to focus on that this morning is because I want you to see that when God looks upon you, he's not just filtering through and like, oh yeah, there's John. Oh yeah, there's Jane. Oh yeah, yeah, I know a little bit about them. He knows intimately everything about you. 
from before you knew you through to the point when you were born in a physical birth, through all the experiences that you had when you can't even remember them, when you were uh, from an infant all the way through. He's seen everything. He knows everything. He knows your thoughts. He knows your deeds. He knows your actions. He knows your inclinations. He knows if you're humble. He knows if you are uh, given over to anger. Uh, he knows your inclinations. He knows you thoroughly. That kind of information in the wrong hands is dangerous, isn't it? If you, if you knew that somebody had all that information about you, that would be a threat to you. In fact, there's um, conversations going on about how social media companies know too much about folks and how it's a, it's a danger to um, society for them knowing so much. And there's trials happening right now in, in America to try and limit the information that, that some uh, companies have because their fear is that they will use this information for harm. The good news that I can share with you is that the God that knows everything about you is good. And the God that knows all of your flaws and all of your um, great points and attributes, he is a God that you can trust with those things. When we understand the trust that we can have in God, we can begin to understand why he has done the things that he has done. And God, knowing us thoroughly, thoroughly, then we can understand what, um, what Paul is saying to the church in Rome, the people that were gathering, understanding who this Jesus is. And we see that God, knowing us thoroughly, he still made a deliberate choice. It says, while we were still helpless, while we were still sinners, some translations have, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for us. So knowing us very well, and knowing the situation we found ourselves in, knowing that we're helpless, and the truth is helpless to change. I, I appreciate Holly when she was giving the prayer earlier that God would open this, that we would, he would drop the scales from our eyes and open our ears to hear. God knows we were blind, deaf, um, unable to connect with him, uh, undesiring of a connection with him. He knew our state. He knew our helplessness. He knew our weakness. He knew our proclivity towards sin. He knows our very nature, but he looks upon us while we're still in that state, that helpless state, and he chose, chose to reach out to us. Not because we earned it in any way, but because he chose of his very nature to reach down and offer us help while we are still not seeking after him or ungodly, as the scriptures say. Think about that. And he reached down and he sought to rescue us when there was nothing deserving of us and sought to bring us into his very presence. It's just powerful to think through that. It's the choice that he would make. Here's what it says. For one will hardly die for a righteous person. But perhaps for the good person, someone would even dare to die. Jesus offered his life for us, as we're going to see. Jesus offered his life for us, even though it goes beyond our thinking. There are some uh, amazing examples in Scripture. There's uh, some amazing examples in history where we see people giving the ultimate sacrifice. We recognize that on Remembrance Day uh, amongst our, our military communities of people that were willing to lay down their lives for freedom, for peace, that were willing to lay down their lives for the safety of their family or for others' family. They were willing to lay down their lives for something good or sacrifice their life for another good person. But the scriptures tell us that God chose, God chose to reach down to us when we were not in that state, when we were actually rebelling against him. The scriptures tell us that as, as Jesus walked towards um, the cross, having the cross on his back as he was suffering, as he was going to be crucified, and as he was being nailed to the cross, Jesus said of the guards, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What does that mean? 
They're blinded, God. They're trapped, God. They don't understand what they're doing, God. They think they're doing something good, but they're not. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God looks upon us, and he offers us his uh, sacrifice because we know not what we do while we're still in that state. And he reaches down. So we go on and we see the action of love. And here's what it says. For God demonstrates his own love towards us. Love is not a word. Love is a demonstration. Love is a sacrifice. Love is an action verb. You got that? Love that's just words is just words. But love that takes on a selfless action, that is where the power of love is found. And it says here that God demonstrated his love towards us. It wasn't just told, it was demonstrated. Many people can say that they love you. But when they do something sacrificially, then that is when you begin to see what love actually looks like. When the scriptures tell us that we are to love one another deeply uh, amongst the, the, the body of Christ, among, amongst Christians. When he says that we are to love one another deeply, or we are to love our enemies, it doesn't mean we go up to someone and say, hey, love you, give me a kiss. <laughs> that means I love you by loving you. I don't even have to say the words I love you. I have to show you what I love you means. And by showing you what I love you means is I am going to step down and I'm going to step underneath being served and instead I will choose to serve you. I'm going to lift your opinions higher than my opinions. Your life more valuable than my life. I'm going to put your priorities above my priorities. And that is in so doing, I am showing love toward you. I am sacrificing for you to better you, to help you. That's what love is. And love is demonstrated, and it is shown. And it is shown towards us. That's what the scriptures tell us. It is shown towards us. Jesus died on the cross for us. As, as Paul was saying these words to the Romans, many of these people did not know Jesus. Many of these people heard about Jesus later, but they did not physically know him, did not walk the sod with him. I'll say it that way. They, they were like us. They had heard about the impact that Jesus had done. They had heard the teachings. They, had, they had, uh, had people around them that witnessed who Christ was and what he had done. But many of them had not ever met Jesus. And as Paul is writing to the Romans, Paul is writing to us today 2,000 years later. And he's saying this, God demonstrates his love towards us. It wasn't just those that walked the sod of that time but towards us. God demonstrated his love towards us. And he goes on and says this, that the action of love is followed by the when of our salvation, that while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, uh, we have a baptism coming up. Really excited about it. We have a lot of folks considering it. We'll see who actually decides to walk through the waters this time, and maybe some will wait to do it another time, and that's okay too. But um, the, the one question that I've often asked or confronted with over and over again is, I don't think I'm ready. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't have this right yet. Um, I, I don't feel worthy. I don't feel like it's an appropriate time yet because I still have to get some things in order before I can be baptized. Well, isn't it a good word that Jesus doesn't wait till we get things in order before he dies for us? That's the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is while you're still a mess, while you're still struggling, while you're, to, to use a, a biblical term, dead in your sins and unable to change, while you're in that state, that is when salvation is offered to you. That while we were still sinners, that's when he comes and rescues us. He doesn't wait until, okay, you got things better? Okay, good, now come and make an appointment. It's like right now. The best illustration that I, I can see of this is how God is described as the great physician. And the physician doesn't wait until you're feeling better before he does his work. 
Right? The physician actually has, actually has to do their work so that you can actually heal and respond to the treatment. And while we were still messed up, or are still messed up, the how of our salvation comes. Christ died for us. That is how our salvation comes. The when is while we're still sinners. And the how is how Christ died for us. We can explore that, and, and I'd love to take some time and explore that in the future with you, how by Christ dying for us, he took the weight of our sin, and he uh, took it off of us, and he stood in our place. There's a lot of um, theological terms you can use, substitutionary, atonement, justification, etc. There's a whole lot of things that happen on the cross where Jesus took our place. The best phrase I heard is for justification. And justification, if you break down justification, it means this, just as if. You got that? Just as if. When Jesus died on the cross for us, it was just as if we had never sinned. He took our place for us. The wrath and the justice of God that is poured out on those that are harming and hurting others was poured out upon Christ as he took on our very sin and the punishment came across on him. Many of you have heard this illustration, but I don't think it's wrong to, to repeat it. As we look before God, the judge, God is very justified in saying before us, yes, you have done this wrong, there is punishment, um, and, and it must be carried out because of the nature of justice. And he sentences us. And in the same breath, he takes off the robe, he comes down, and he stands in our stead and says, I will take it instead of you. I will take the wrath instead of you. And he becomes our sacrifice. And someone does pay for those things. But it's Jesus so that we can be free. Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for himself. Christ didn't die to abolish the law. Christ didn't die for... Um, for any other reason except for us, for those that he loves. That is the reason why he died. So that you can experience a fullness of life. That's the demonstration of his love towards us. And he knows you. <laughs> and you know what? Since he knows you so well, he knows you're probably going to mess up again. Right? He knows you will mess up again. And that same grace that is extended to you in your salvation is a grace that is extended to you in your discipleship and in your growth in Christ. That, that grace is not a once, uh, a once time for you. And that, okay, you're all good now. Don't mess up again. The grace is extended to you for the rest of life into eternity as we turn to him. He is the sacrificial lamb. He has died for us so that his blood washes us just as the blood of the lamb covered over the, the posts of the doors in, um, in Egypt. His blood covers over you and that you are set free. You do not need to take on the wrath. You have been saved from it. The action of love. And in so doing, as we receive Christ's atoning sacrifice, we can begin to walk in the newness of life that he has offered by his Holy Spirit. We're going to continue on in that um, as we look continue on next week. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we thank you that not only do you know us extremely well, that you know us better than we know ourselves. But in that knowledge, you are not turned away from us. Instead, you are drawn to us and you draw us to you. You see our weakness and you see our failures. You see our flaws. You see our past. You see our actions. You see our words. You see our inclinations. You see that 
in us, there are so many things that are selfish and, and, um, and, and pointing away from you. But Lord, you look down and you rescue us from ourselves. We thank you for that. And as you rescue us from, your, from ourselves, you seek to fill us with um, the spirit that we desperately need the Holy Spirit to indwell within us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd invite